Hi, it's me, um, your friendly neighborhood uh, dog walker, and I'm sure that you've heard of Snow White. I, I know that you've seen the movie, and if you haven't, you don't need to pause this and watch it first. But we are going to be talking about the Disney version of Snow White, and I'm very excited. Um, especially, we're going to be talking about the voice actress who played Snow White. So, um, let's get into it. I have so much to tell you. So, let's talk about Adriana Casalotti. Her full name is Adriana Ellen Loretta Casalotti. I'm pretty sure you've seen the movie. Um, I have quite a few times, but um, I had no idea who the voice actor, actress, or any of the voice actors were for a very long time. So this is the rabbit hole that I fell into. Uh, Adriana was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut in May 6, 1916. Um, she was born to the parents who were Italian immigrants. They immigrated from Italy to New York. Um, the, her mom and dad, um, Guido and Maria, um, they had a daughter before her. So she had an older sister and they were all, all of them were amazing musicians and amazing singers. Um, her dad taught uh, voice and singing and opera. And that's how they made a living. Her mom was in the, her mom sang in the royal orchestra and her sister became a, a famous singer as well and a famous vocal coach, 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 <laughs> Vo famous vocal coach that um, helped and coached um, some of the most famous opera singers of that era. So this is a really, really, really amazing singing family. I would love to have Thanksgiving dinner with them or have, uh, I guess, I guess there's no Thanksgiving carols. Okay. I would like to have Christmas dinner with them and listen to their carols. Adriana was, uh, like I said earlier, she was born in Connecticut. Unlike her parents, um, they were born in Italy she died in LA. So before she even hit uh, teenage dumb, uh, her entire family moved to LA. In 1934, Roy Scott, the casting director for this Snow White movie, was uh, contacted her dad. And he was very, very well known in the music scene and everything like that. So when Roy Scott ca contacted her father and asked his advice on how to cast this person, because this was going to be the first feature length movie, Disney and everyone working for Disney knew that this movie was going to be different. They knew that it was going to completely change the way that cinema was created. Um, there was a lot of pressure on it because they felt as if it didn't go through and be successful, then Disney might fall apart. Disney Corporation might fall apart. So there was a lot of pressure for everybody to make this work. Um, Rory Scott, cast, uh, the casting director, like I said, contacted her dad and her dad gave them his daughter, not gave, but suggested his daughter. Um, they kind of said no because she was much older. She was 18 years old at the time. So they lied to get her into the audition saying that she was 16. Um, and she still seemed too old for them. Walt Disney was the one who interviewed her and it took them a year to get back to her and say that she got the part. They interviewed so many other girls and she has such a unique and beautiful voice for talking and for singing. It was very, very musical in and out of the song. Um, you've heard it. You know that there's no other voice like hers. So they auditioned a hundred, over 140 girls for this part 
and they didn't hire her. They didn't call her back for a year. So they hired her in 1934, and they agreed on the amount of getting paid $20 a day, totaling $170 for all of the voice acting work that she did. Even though they knew that they were going to make this a feature-length film, they never told her, and this was her first time working in a, a studio like this. She talks so fondly about all of her memories um, recording for Disney for this specific movie and for all of the little tiny, tiny, tiny itty bitty gigs that she got afterwards from Disney playing Snow White. Um, $20 a day was a normal amount for doing voice acting work. It was, this, this movie was setting the standard also for what a feature length movie should, should pay and should treat their voice actors. Um, there was no union because this was such a new thing. Again, this is the first. I couldn't find out anywhere that I looked if they lied to her, if they actively told her, no, this isn't a feature length film, but it was very, very clear in all of her interviews that they definitely misled her. They never corrected her in her assumptions of it being a feature length. So that kind of removed her ability to haggle for her contract properly and to ne negotiate for herself. In one of her interviews, she specifically said that they had told her that it was going to be a little longer um, than one of their shorts. And one of their shorts was about 10 to 12 minutes. So she thought that it would be maybe 20 minutes long. Um, that's not a feature length. That's not more than an hour. It's only 20 minutes. Um, so she said that she did not realize what was happening until she went to the premiere and she saw the movie itself. And the premiere is something that we have to talk about also. So <laughs> imagine doing all of this voice acting work, waiting an entire, for starters, getting interviewed, waiting an entire year to realize that you're hired and that and that Mr. Disney himself has handpicked you and said this is the perfect girl for the show or the movie and then doing all of the voice acting work doing all of the songs going above and beyond so you're doing all of this voice acting work and the movie starts going into editing and you're getting more and more excited to see it and your invitation to the premiere doesn't show up and you think okay maybe it was just a miscommunication they put my wrong address down or it got lost in the mail or something like that. So you get all dressed up. You're super excited. You go with your co-star, the prince, and you two go together to the premiere. Your door gets open for you. You walk down the red carpet. You're waiting to get in. And the person at the front says that you're not invited. Disney specifically made sure not to invite. Like, that just blows my mind. Both the prince and Adriana were not invited to the premiere. They had people dressed up in the the dwarf costumes. They got seats, not her. So Harry Scottwell, the prince chart the voice actor for Prince Charming and her, snuck in and she described the, the sensation of sneaking in and watching this movie. And that was the first time watching the movie in the premiere. She realized that this was not just a short, this was an entire movie. And they knew from the beginning completely that it was not going to be a short and they completely misled her so that she, she didn't have enough knowledge to be able to help herself. Um, and it was too late because that was already after she signed contracts. So at the end of the premiere, when all of the credits are showing, it shows, it shows the animators, it shows the directors, it shows the body doubles and the people who, the dancers who were used to rotoscope these creations, but it doesn't show the voice actors. And it was kind of a common thing to not um, credit your voice actors, but also previous to this, 
There literally was never a a feature length animated show. Like I can't uh, animate a movie. I can't stress this enough. It was completely breaking boundaries, this movie. So Disney was kind of somewhat following the way that it has been, but also he was continuing to set a standard on how to treat employees. There was no union. There was no um, people to help the workers. Um, So Disney very much, I feel, took advantage of the way that this was a new thing that he could determine how he felt it should be. And later on, he specifically said that it was on purpose to not credit the voice actors because he believed crediting the voice actors would give less life to the movie. And he wanted these animated people to have, to live in someone's brain as if they were real. He truly believed that he owned her voice. Exactly like Ursula from Little Mermaid. He believed he owned, like, I just, I just... (laughs) If it was me, um, the combination of all the work and heart I put into this, and then not seeing my name in the credits after a movie that I had to sneak into, after a movie I wasn't even invited to, um, after them lying to me, saying it wasn't going to be a feature-length film, and then it was, I would feel pretty hurt. But the ent- her entire life, Adriana's entire life, She never spoke ill about the Disney Corporation or Mr. Disney in general. It was amazing how happy and how fond she would always reflect on these memories. For Adriana's entire rest of her life, she somewhat styled her hair like Snow White. And so I believe that maybe she got in the habit of doing her hair for Disney in a specific way and then continued because it had so many wonderful memories to her. Um, she, she continued to tour and to be Snow White's body double whenever they were doing a press conference until children started to complain that she looked too old. Um, this was extremely, extremely hurtful for her. And this, I think, I believe is where the severity of her contract started kicking in because she was not allowed to use her voice for anything ever again. She didn't teach voice acting. She didn't, she wasn't allowed to make a record. She wasn't allowed to do voice acting where she was just talking and communicating. She wasn't allowed to do anything. Just Snow White and nothing else. In my research, when I have gone down this rabbit hole, I found out that Mr. Disney seemed to do this with a few women in his life. Um, He would find them. He'd pick this girl out, a young girl, and say, this is the one that is going to be my favorite, and give them a different type of attention. Uh, Another example of this was one of the original Mouseketeers, who he also cock-blocked and tried his hardest to not allow her to grow past what he wanted to be able to uh, control. Um, He believed, he truly believed that he owned Adriana's voice. He even, at one point, the Disney Corporation started listing voice actors for the Snow White movie, and they listed all the other voice actors, including the voice actors that's, that dubbed it for other languages, because Snow White's in so many languages. Everyone else was vo- uh, listed in the credits, except for her. So, another great example of his contracts being... Uh, incongruent, not consistent, between people. Marge Champion was the dancer who modeled for Snow White. Marge Champion is an amazing woman. She's so cool. When I went, started researching her, I was like, oh my gosh, this lady is so great. But uh, anyway, she, um, they would film her and then use her body and dancing and her hand movements to rotoscope what Snow White would look like. Um, Marge Champion did a lot of different things uh, through her life. Um, For Snow White, she was paid $10 a day, so less money. But after Snow White, 
She also body doubled for a lot of different things for Disney, including some for Pinocchio. She also went on multiple different shows, multiple different movies. She was in, um, she had her own TV series called The Marge and Gower Champion Show. Marge Champion was a champion. She was amazing. She was an actor and a choreographer in Broadway. And she starred in shows and helped out in shows, uh, shows like Hello Dolly and a whole bunch of other. I encourage you to look her up. She's incredible. But, uh, and she also, she also owned a dance studio in New York City. I feel like if you're going to be a dancer, that is like the highest thing that you can do is like have a dance studio in New York City. It Along with being in film, being in theater, she also owned a dance studio in New York City. Like, this girl had it. Okay, so, Disney never cock-blocked her. The corporation never cock-blocked her. They never expressed that they owned the way that her hands move, or they own her look. Like, she had that look in those hands in that body movement before Disney saw her. Adriana had her voice before Disney heard her. I don't understand what the difference is. It's someone's body. So, I, I just, it's just another example that he specifically was seeking to treat Adriana slightly different than other wo- women that he had hired. In 1983, Snow White was nominated for Best Musical Score. Blah, 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 for Best Musical Score and the Academy Awards. Also, in 1938, Jack Benny contacted Adriana, our girl, uh, to be on his radio for a gig. Um, he enjoyed her, he wanted to talk to her, but this was part of the larger Disney Corporation, so he asked, he had to ask permission from Disney, and Disney said no. Um, and uh, Jack has gone on and said specifically that Disney said, no, that's, I own her voice. You're not allowed to use her voice. Um, but this is one of the only people that spoke poorly-ish about Disney, you know, when it refers, when it comes to Snow White. Um, his exact quote was, I don't want to spoil the illusion of Snow White. Sorry, but that voice cannot be used anywhere. I don't want to spoil the illusion of Snow White. Disney didn't care about the livelihood of a human being. He cared about an illusion of a movie that he was making millions on. And we'll get to that in a little bit. In 1963, 30 years later, Disney hired her to record some dialogue for Canada Association. In 1989, the United States, so quite a bit later, in 1989, the United States Library of Congress deemed the film culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant, and it was one of the first 25 films preserved in the National Film Registry. She also was hired to work on The Wizard of Oz, um, and she got paid a hundred dollars to sing the line, Wherefore Art Thou Romeo? So you can hear her voice be used one other time. Um, All of her roles ever were uncredited. She was only hired back by Disney. She was never allowed to make her own records. She recorded Disney, uh, she recorded some dialogue that was deleted from Snow White, um, and she was replaced by someone, uh, Mary Kay Bergman. She ended up completely abandoning her passion of singing, and she went into the stock market and real estate, and that's how she made her money, and that was her job, even though she had extensive training and such a beautiful, unique voice. Canada Disney, or Disney Canada, I believe it is, they contacted her at some point and asked her to record some, like, phone conversations, um, with Disney as if 
kids were able to call Disney her and, and ask questions and stuff like that. Um, and she record telephone and doorbell stuff for them in the Disney Snow White voice. In total, her entire lifetime, her life's work of singing, she only made $16,000 from Disney. In 1940, Disney released her songs that she sang on a record. She did not get a dime for it. So her only record that she ever was able to produce as a singer wasn't produced by her. It was produced by Disney and they gave credit to Snow White and not her. They took all the money and it was a lot of money. In 1993, the eighth release of the film happened. Um, and she desired to have a little bit more compensation. She didn't want to, uh, in her interviews, she talked about the woman Peggy Lee from Lady and the Tramp. Peggy Lee successfully sued Disney Corporation to, for more money, for credits, for what she deserved, and rightfully what she deserved. Adriana said, I realize I might have to, but I don't want to go through what Peggy, th Peggy Lee had to. She was 77 at that time, and she really didn't want to have to deal with all of that. She was hoping for a much more diplomatic uh, conversation that Disney and her could actually have, as if they were friends, as if Mr. Disney was still alive and she could talk to him directly. She kept saying that she felt her time to ask for more money was the time that her video went, or her movie went to VHS. Her video was the last one to go to VHS. So it took her an extremely long time to wait patiently to get, uh, to get this, the courage, I guess, to ask for more money from Disney. When this was going on, she said, I'm much older. I'm 77 and it would be a big chore. I would rather do it in an, in an amicable way. In the end, with that, they ended up having to do, uh, go through a lawsuit. Both her and her course co-star, Harry Scottwell, sued them. She was asking for only 200000 She was only asking for 200000 He was only asking for 100000 A measly amount. Something that the, the, the movie made over and over, like, I'll get to those numbers later, but they were completely unsuccessful. Harry was only asking for 100,000 and she was asking for double, so 200,000, and both of them were unsuccessful in their lawsuit. Um, this is completely ridiculous in my opinion. There's some rumors out there that behind closed doors, they had some agreements um, to brush off the lawsuit and for her to publicly take the the unsuccessful lawsuit i'm guessing to hopefully discourage other people from trying to establish um their own body autonomy and um to try to mislead uh people from doing this because the person the woman from lady and the tramp was so successful it inspired other people to look at their contracts and go wow maybe a corporation doesn't own my body Another negative experience that she had in 1993, she was not used as the voice actress. And this is, I think, one of the first times um, they were getting a, an Academy Award and they used someone else to voice act Snow White to give the Academy Award. And it was the most hurtful thing uh, uh, that Disney could have done. And she only spoke about that one moment as being a hurtful thing. Everything else that she spoke about Disney, she said, was sunshine and roses and stars, and this one specific moment was the moment that hurt her. But things got a little bit better. In 1994, Disney gave her an award specifically. Disney gave her the Legend Award. Uh, they Disney gave her the Disney Legend Award, <laughs> and they asked her to press her hands into concrete in front of the Disney Theater, and at this point, she was the first female voice actor 
to be initiated into their, I guess, the Hall of Fame, um, and to be awarded like this and to be recognized like this. I can't even imagine the type of relief and joy that she would have felt after being hidden for so many years to finally have some sort of recognition. In LA on January 18th, 1997, she passed away. She never complained about Disney till the day she died. There were interviews with her until she was very, very old, very close to her death, and she never spoke ill about Mr. Disney or the Disney Corporation. I, in some of the interviews that I read, it stated that she was completely and totally 100% snow white until the day she died. She spoke like her, she commanded a room, and she acted exactly the way that you would think Snow White would act. She, she had Snow White memorabilia all over her house. She had a wishing well in her front yard. She had some signs that said like, I think it was said like the, the real Snow White or something like that. She had her doorbell and her answering machine singing Snow White songs. And I just absolutely love that she cherished that part of her life. It must have been so fun, so interesting to be like that, to have this opportunity and to finally, before she passed away, actually see recognition. So let's talk about the movie just a little bit. The movie has made $418 million. This is not including merch. This is not including the sequels. This is not including any of the press showings or the tours. This is not including anything in that theme park or any other theme park. Not including the video games, and it's definitely not including the Broadway musical. So, this one movie, Box Office, made $418 million back then. Isn't that crazy? And they couldn't even give them a little bit of money to give them credit. I just find it ridiculous. I find it so, so petty and ridiculous for the Disney Corporation to be that self-centered. Adjusted with inf inflation, it is one of the top 10 performances in North American box offices. Worldwide, with adjusted with inflation, it is the top earning animated film. It also briefly held the highest grossing sound film. It was at the time, it doesn't have that record yet, or anymore. The popularity of this film has led to it being released theatrically many times. So this is just like incredible, the amount of money that this movie made. Let alone, it prevented the Disney company originally from going under. It was their lifesaver. In 2008, the American Film In Institute ranked this among the 100 greatest films, and it also named the film as the greatest animated film of all time. This film has broken so many records. This film has accrued so much money in so many different ways. This film is Disney. It would not be in existence if this film wasn't made. And I'm so happy that I was able to find out more about her. She's such an interesting woman, and I cherish her voice even more now that I know all of this about her. Um, before I go, I'm going to tell you one interesting fact about her that has absolutely nothing to do with Disney. In her interviews, she claimed to be the first woman to ever wear a bikini in public. Snow White is an incredible movie. I love it so much. I think that after learning so much about this woman, she might be my favorite. Maybe Adriana is my favorite fairy tale princess. And she kind of gets a real life um, fairy tale ending. She had a hard time. She worked her ass off. And in the end, she did get credit. And usually in our world right now, 
that doesn't even happen. Maybe they'll get credit after they die. But she got to live that victory. And I just am so thrilled for her. So, um, I hope you enjoyed learning about her as much as I did.